Hi, welcome to Signal Path. I have a pretty exciting episode for you guys today. This is an Azure and M9505A. This is an AXIE chassis. By itself, it's not exciting at all, of course. It all has to do with what we're going to put in here, and I want to show you some pretty cool cars that I have, and we're going to test that. Now, this chassis has a very minor problem. This button is stuck, and as a result, whenever you turn it on, it is forced to stay always on, it turns on and off, it's a bit of a problem. It also has a group of fans over here, which are which can be removed and cleaned. And this thing can exhaust, I believe, up to about 200 watts per lane here. So that's a lot of power as a result, an AXIE chassis like this, it can be used for a lot of different functions. These things are a lot more complex than they appear on the surface. There's an entire block diagram describing how the interfaces of the back plane are and how they're connected together and the various cars that can go in there. These things have their own firmware and you can talk to them and so on. So let's go ahead and do things one step at a time. So I'm going to keep the suspense high. I'm not going to show you what's in here until uh, we get to it one step at a time. Start with the switch and work our way from there. It is a little annoying to get this to this switch because you can't reach it very easily from here. You have to remove this entire top and a ton of screws from the side. So I'm going to save it the boring stuff. All right, about 4,000 screws later, <laughs> we are already inside here. So here's the main input power coming in filter. There's two circuit breakers. All of that goes into the power supply, which is inside of this box over here. We also can look further in. You can see all the power going into the chassis. There's a secret USB port that's not accessible from anywhere unless you open the top. Must be some factory programming. There's some EEPROMs over there, so that's all the backplane connection. There's actually not a, a lot of PCB material there. This is really the only thing. Is most of it is mechanical chassis fans and bringing everything in at the same time. And here is our switch all the way there. We just have to get it out. All right, so here's the power switch outside of the unit. I already separated it into two pieces, and you can see on the inside that there is a metal rod, and that moves up and down, which makes contact with these two over here. There's also an LED inside of this with a light pipe that couples into this entire transparent piece here and then it shines through this. So it's a really nice switch, this is metal, uh, but unfortunately the latch in here, the piece that makes sure that this thing stays in and out as you press them, that's broken. That's why the switch was stuck on the inside and when I moved the plastic, yeah, it just came back, but now it, you know, it doesn't stay in place anymore. So we're going to have to replace this switch. And it's going to be very hard to find this. So I'm going to see if I can find some kind of a replacement for it just so we can get this thing going. All right, so here we are after the modification. I just kept the, basically the metal part of the switch, which was something that mounts to the chassis. And now we have even a key. So I just had this lying around. So it's basically exactly the same function. There's no LED in this. I'm going to mount the LED separately. But now we can put it back into the instrument. And here's the final installation. I think it turned out pretty good. It even has an added security. So now let's take a look at the cars that go inside. All right, so here's the very first card we're going to put into the AXIE chassis. This is a system module, and I believe this is the minimum requirement. So when you purchase an AXIE chassis, it has to come with one of these in order to communicate with the main motherboard in the back, and of course communicate with every other card you're going to put into this module. Without this, then you're going to have no way of sending and receiving data to those modules, and some of them would require a lot of data. They have a lot of memory, they have a lot of high-speed interfaces. As a result, this thing actually has a PCIe Express interface. And interestingly, there is one on the inside as well, and a switch that you can use to select between the internal and the external PCIe Express. This must be an option that this instrument clearly doesn't have. You can see a whole bunch of in, in components here are not even populated. There's a big BGA component not populated over here. And this thing can have a USB interface, which is quite convenient if you don't have a PCIe interface on your PC. Obviously, it's going to be much slower, but there's also a, a gigabit Ethernet in the front as well. So this one doesn't have the USB, which is unfortunate. Uh, there's a dc dc converter over here. This is a network SOC processor. These are clusters of transformers, probably to magnetically couple into something. It's just kind of an like isolation. And then we have two ICs on here, which I'm not sure what they are. Could be FPGAs. There is an FPGA here as well. A whole bunch of other interfaces, which are obviously not popular. That this thing can be configured in many, many different ways. So there's not much exciting, exciting things on this, uh, because normally, if you have an embedded controller inside an AXI, it becomes much more convenient, because the PC is going to be built into it. But the PC is going to have to have this form factor, and it's totally custom made. And I have one of those, and I want to show you what it looks like. Okay, so here is our embedded controller, and you can see it's a totally custom PC. It's based on an Intel processor, of course. I think it's an i5 or an i7. We will find out. So you find all the normal components you expect in the PC. We have memory, the processor, video cards are all in here. But it has to fit in a really small form factor. So we have two-phase heat pipes coming out of this main heat sink where all the processors are. And then air is flowing this way throughout. So you can see all the, the orientations of the heat sinks line up, and the fans on the side of the AXIE chassis cool this whole thing down. 
the entire DCDC power and all the power management is handled over here. <laughs> Look at this cluster of capacitors. We have two gigabit Ethernet ports coming in. We have three USB 3s, two USB 2s. We have three display ports. So this thing is obviously intended to be used in a variety of situations. There is indeed even an extra PCI Express on here as well. This one has a removable solid state drive. Another PCI Express slot over here and some diagnostic seven segments with the CMOS for the uh, memory, of course, for the BIOS. And there's another card over here, it could be a bridge, could be an FPGA, I'm not sure. It might be handling the interfaces to the bus. So yeah, it's a really nice design. These things are quite expensive because they're totally custom made, of course, for this kind of application. So let's add that to the chassis as well. There's a cover I've taken off, of course, it's all protected. And we're gonna take a look at the most exciting one. And here is the star of the show. This is the Keysight M8190A. This is a dual channel arbitrary waveform generator. 12 giga sample per second at 12 bits or 8 giga sample per second at 14 bits. It has more than 90 dBc of spurious dynamic range, which for the kind of bandwidth it provides is absolutely excellent. This thing can do all the way up to 5 gigahertz of analog bandwidth. This particular one also has digital up conversion built into it, so you can modulate it around the carrier directly in the digital domain, prevent you from having to waste some of the dynamic range of the DAX. This one also has direct output as well as the amplified output. 2 giga sample of memory per channel. It is pretty much the industry standard for radar, 5G, and wireless testing. Keysight also has a version of this that's 128 giga sample per second 4 channel, which can run at 256 giga sample per second at uh, 2 channel. That's a totally different instrument, of course, intended for optical coherent testing. But for wireless testing, it's hard, hard to beat the performance of this unit. So I can't wait to fire it up, but we should take a look inside and see what it looks like a little bit before we plug it in. And here is what is inside the M8198. It is beautiful, quite modular as to be expected. On the left side, we have the entire DAC module for one channel and the DAC module for the other channel. It looks like that the memory interface, DAC, and everything is all underneath these two heatsink sections here. Probably some custom ICs from Keysight, I would imagine. And the same thing on the other side. Most likely maybe an FPGA here, which interfaces to the bus and manages the data transfer from the memory of the DAC and everything else to the outside. There's a dummy bus termination at the top and the main one here is at the bottom. And if I look on the right side, we have a huge heatsink which is sitting on top of this entire DC-DC converter section. This is obviously burning a lot more power and therefore even though this DC-DC converter is probably 90% efficient, it's still going to have some airflow over it to cool it down with a heatsink. We have two output interface boards with a whole bunch of mechanical RF relays to switch between the direct output, amplified output, AC, DC coupling, and so on. And if you look at the connections that go into and out of the DAC, all the high speed connections, we have five coaxial cables going in. It looks like to be a differential clock on the right side. We have the differential output coming directly from the DAC ASIC, and then we have a mark sample out which goes directly to the output. So you can see that they don't, they're not routing any of those signals onto the board anywhere. The only PCB that sees the high-speed signal is basically this one over here, and a tiny trace on that one, in order to preserve as much of the bandwidth and spurious-free dynamic range of the analog output as possible. I'll also give you a side view so we can see the clocking, which is all embedded underneath it. This, I believe, is based on a YIG uh, synthesizer inside, and if not, at least a DRO, because this is very important to have ultra low phase noise and ultra low jitter because otherwise the entire spirit free dynamic range and the signal to noise and quantization ratio of the DAC will be completely ruined if the clock is not good. And there's also possibilities for synchronization between multiple units. This can be, you know, it can have as many channels essentially as you want. So really quite uh, expandable and sophisticated design. And here's a profile view. And yes, I believe there is a gig oscillator right there. So all the PLL, clock generation, distribution, everything is on this board. There is also some other heatsink components in the back, so there is a lot of stuff happening there. Fairly complex. Here is the wraparound uh, heatsinks, which take advantage of the copper embedded into the PCB to bring a lateral and then vertical heat out of the board. These are nice uh, low-profile devices, so you don't have to put anything on the other side in order to cool something through the PCB. You see them quite often in these type of instruments. Yeah, looking really nice. Now we got to put it back in and try it out. Okay, so here's our test setup. At the bottom now I have everything installed and I may have overdone it a little bit with this LED, but at least it is acting also as a lighthouse. We have the PC at the bottom and the M8190 of course at the top. So the channel 1 single-ended output of the M8190 goes into channel 1 and channel 2 goes into channel 3. I'm using the S-series scope as opposed to the MXR because I don't have the right version of the VSA which works with the MSR, but that's okay. The S-series would be just fine to do our demodulation and analysis of how good the quality of this signal is and we can do a few experiments with it. 
So let's go to the PC now so I can show you the setup. And here we are at the screen of the embedded controller. This is the arbitrary wave from generator M8190 soft control panel, and you can download this from the Keysight website. Of course, once you have the hardware in there, and you can pretty much set anything that has to do with the unit directly from the soft control panel. This includes things like clocking, references, how the clock is divided and passed to other instruments or your device under test. Controlling the output, of course, amplitude, whether it's DC or AC, coupled to the amplifier being active or not, as well as various delays and alignments. You can also create custom waveforms, like uh, standard waveforms, multi-tone modulation. This is not a full review of the M8190, so we're not going to go into details of all of that in this video, but I do want to do a few quick tests. Now, my favorite way of programming it is using uh, IQ Tools, which is a MATLAB script also provided for free by Keysight. You can download that from their website, and I have already downloaded it. And it has an interface like this. It works with a variety of their arbitrary waveform generators, not just the M8190. And once you run this and control it, then you can pretty much forget about the soft control panel. So we can do digital modulation, we can do multi-tone as a quick test. So you saw the setup, we are connected directly to the scope. So I'm also going to use the VSA to take a look at it. So let's go ahead and download some multi-tone and see how well it behaves. So we're going to create 25 tones, starting from 10 megahertz, stopping at 2 gigahertz with a random phase. And the way this is going to get downloaded, the real part is going to be on channel 1, and imaginary, the Q, is going to be on channel 2, which means that the scope can do a mathematical transformation and interpret that as IQ quadrature data. So let's go back over here. Let me download this into the instrument. Let's go back to the VSA. And here it is. I've already configured it. And don't worry about all the other screens. They have to do with digital modulation. For now, let's just focus on the bottom left here. Look at how beautiful this looks. These are the 25 tones. There is no calibration on this. This is raw from the instrument and the losses of the cable that are used to connect the S3 scope to the M8190. So we have here one, two, three, four, about 40 dBC image rejection, which is very, very good. So let's go over here into the soft control panel. I just want to show you what happens when we adjust the delay a little bit. So if you look at over here, this is the mathematically computed image. There's almost nothing because the signal is so precisely quadrature. I'm going to go ahead and add a finite, just a tiny amount of delay. Look at what happens. This is 30 picoseconds. As soon as I add some delay, we immediately get a degradation in our image rejection. The further you are from the center, the worse this is going to be. This is normal. This is a mathematical consequence of this kind of delay. I'm going to set it back to zero. So we're going to do some fine adjustments, see how well we can get this image to go down. I think I had it fairly optimized already. There you go, I think two and a half picoseconds is good. So you can see what fine control you have over the adjustment and how much of a difference it makes when you're down in the 40 dB image rejection region. So I'd say that's pretty impressive. So let's go back over here and let's download some modulation. Let's see what do we have here. I have a set for a gigabot. Uh, 4096 symbols, QAM64, no problem. Let's go ahead and download that. There it is, here's our QAM. Let me go over here. Let's do some adjustment on this. We don't need to look at such a wide frequency range. We can probably look at just 3 gigahertz. Here's our QAM signal. Now there is no equalization on this, but of course we will need equalization because there is going to be a frequency response of the scope and a frequency response of the actual connectors and the cables that are in the middle. Let's go ahead and turn it on. Let's see how good we can get this EVM to be. There we go. Let's go ahead and reset this. Let it run again. And check this out. So here is a channel response that is being equalized. Remember, this is only 0.15 dB per division. So the equalization is really, really subtle. It's quite small. But because you have complex modulation, it does make a big difference. Let's auto scale this. And check it out. Look at the SNR. We're talking 36.2 dB SNR. For an IQ independent signal, this is baseband, going into the S-scope and being interpreted by BSA. That's a sub 1% EVM for a gigabot 64 qualm signal. I'd say that's pretty impressive. And this is, of course, the raw data coming from the instrument. The equalization can then be saved back onto the unit and then done with pre-emphasis. So you can have this applied in advance to the signal. What else can we do with this to see if it's working? Well, why don't we do a digital up conversion with it, which is also quite interesting. So for digital up conversion, we don't need both I and Q data. Let's go on the digital modulation. I'm going to give it an offset carrier. Let's do, let's say, 2.5 gigahertz. There you go. So now it's going to have a 2.5 gigahertz offset carrier with a 1 gigahertz modulation around 2.5 gigahertz. Let's go download that. Okay, so that's going to move out of the screen here. 
So we're going to have to change the input. We don't need that anymore. We're just going to do channel one. Let's apply that. All right, and let's go over here and set the center frequency to be at two and a half gigahertz. And we can look at a span of, you know, let's say two gigahertz, probably more than enough. All right, look at that. That is beautiful. Let's go ahead and apply the reset equalization. So now the equalization is going to have to be quite a bit more aggressive in this case because we have digital up conversion. So this signal is now has a center frequency of two and a half gigahertz. All of this is being done directly with the M8190. This is a modulated signal that comes out. So you can imagine how powerful this is now because you can create multiple carriers at the same time because of the digital up conversion built into the M8190. You don't need an external mixer. You don't have to worry about any of that. It's all synchronized. And you can see the equalization shape is now quite different. And again, because part of it is the output of the M8190 requires calibration, requires equalization. And of course, the cables have quite a bit more loss slope at this frequency. Yeah, I think this, this works really well. So I'm really eager to try this out with a whole bunch of our setup. This was just a quick video to get the AXIE chassis working because it was broken. But now that we have it, there's going to be lots of interesting things coming in the future using this instrument. I hope you enjoyed this quick video. I'll see you next time.